Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about XFX doing shady things. That's right, XFX, the brand everyone knows for removing vowels from its product names, has now also removed the value from its products on customs forms. It was a simple accident. The $3 million off. But anyway, we'll be talking about that. Intel disabling ABX 512 for future versions of Alder Lake Silicon. Intel, AMD, and ARM joining forces for future chipset interconnect solutions. We'll also be talking about the Threader for Pro 5000WX series that was announced last week and going over some other news like, for example, the NVIDIA Ada Lovelace GPUs that might have a lot of CUDA cores. Before that, this video is sponsored by Linode. Linode is a Linux server hosting provider that GN has used for nearly a decade now for its own servers. Alongside dedicated website hosting, Linode makes it easy to cut out third-party VPN services to build your own VPN that you fully control, easily configured via the interface. Linode also has hundreds of guides for custom servers, including game server apps like Rust, Minecraft, CSGO, and guides to host your own video calling servers to eliminate third parties. Linode is a great way to take back control of software and your hosting, and Gamers Nexus viewers get a $100 credit for 60 days on new accounts at linode.com slash gamersnexus or click the link below. First up, a quick GN update on things. We've done a ton of research and digging the last week or so on the Artesian build story. It's not over yet. It's actually a hell of a story, and uh, it's absolutely baffling how crazy things were behind the scenes there. It was a lot more than just that one giveaway unraveling everything. Things were falling apart for Artesian builds well before that. But the some of the stuff we found is uh, concerning and probably legally very interesting to some people. So we're working on more of a story there. We've connected with a, a large portion of the former employees of Artesian Builds who, if you aren't caught up on this, were basically abruptly laid off in the blink of an eye at about 8 p.m. Eastern time one night. So we've connected with a bunch of the former employees. Uh, a good portion of the people we met with have very promising features already locked in with some of their own endeavors and projects that hopefully we'll be able to report back on sometime soon. And uh, for those who have reached out to us, we've been building a spreadsheet that we're planning to share with some of the manufacturers who are hiring in the industry to help some of the talented people from Artesian Builds land at a place that is run by uh, more competent leadership. Oh, and there's the re-roll. Not particularly competent is probably the nicest way we could uh, describe the leadership that drove the company into the ground. Anyway, we've got a ton of details, and it's a fascinating story. Can't wait to share it all with you, but it's going to take a lot of storyboarding and building, just like with the new egg stuff. But just the reason we're putting this update here is because uh, this is sort of what I used to do on more of the game side before we pivoted really hard into hardware testing. And I've always found it fun to do research and reporting and putting together the story and figuring out what exactly went wrong or what happened or what is happening. We did that with Newegg and it sort of reawakened that interest. And now uh, we're putting together another big story on what happened with Artesian. This isn't obviously taken away from any of the testing. We're still publishing reviews and all that stuff. But we're going to dot some of these pieces in throughout the year as more of a journalism uh, slant and less of a testing focused one. So we're really enjoying it as a team. It's uh, it's a little bit mix of creative and reporting and objectivity and subjectivity. So really fun to work on, and you'll have more of that to look forward to. Anyway, if you want to support this effort and the many others that take uh, a completely different approach to content creation, you can head over to store.gamersaccess.net and grab things like our PC building mod mats. You can also get mouse mats like the red and black HUD design. That's one of our newest designs on the store, or the long-standing blue and black wireframe mouse mat on store.gamersnexus.net. OK, first major stories for the week is going to be XFX potentially doing something illegal or, at best, really shady. So XFX, of course, is a video card partner of AMD's, famous mostly for making the thick with two Cs. Yes, that's a real video card name. And the kick and the not really sure how you're SWFT. So uh, XFX's China branch recently had 5,840 video cards seized by the uh, Chinese government customs authority, the port authorities in Huang Gong, China. And the Chinese customs authority claims that the value of the products in transit was actually $3 million higher than the declared value on the customs forms. Now this, if you look at it at face value, might look bad. But 
Moving on. In theory, this would reduce the duties owed by XFX to China and to the countries receiving the goods on the other side. Here's one of the photos actually from the Chinese Customs Authority showing the XFX. We're not sure that name is appropriate for a video card actually. Oh wait, oh it's the, it says kick, that's a, that's a Q, got it, okay. Now unless XFX saw Artesian's tax woes and thought, hey, tax fraud sounds like a pretty good idea right now, there is another possibility. The website My Drivers noted that XFX has apparently previously sold GPU inventory from mining companies to consumers as new product. Now if this is true, it would reduce the value of the inventory, so maybe the declaration becomes accurate in some form now that it's tactically, in the real world, a second-hand item, uh, but now enters a new problem, which is declaring a second-hand heavily used item as a new one. There's a difference where if you're buying a used mining card and you know that's its history, that's fine. But as soon as you think it's brand new in box, but it's not, Obviously, this is a problem regardless of whether it was mining. So whatever is going on here, uh, it certainly doesn't look good for XFX. The, there were actually some documents that uh, were published as well showing the hard dip in revenue, where something like 84% or something reduction year over year for uh, the period being measured in revenue. So whatever is going on with XFX right now, it looks like they are working their hardest to go out of business. Either way, XFX is scaling down its costs and trying to tighten procurement, it says, to try and become more profitable. So we'll see if it survives whatever the hell it's doing right now. But uh, whatever it is, it, it doesn't seem like you should really be able to go out of business in this current market if your primary business is making video cards. Up next, AMD Threadripper news. So AMD is expanding the Threadripper Pro family with the new Threadripper Pro 5000 WX series. Threadripper Pro 5000 will be based on AMD Zen 3, conferring all of the IPC, clock speed, and efficiency benefits that come with Zen 3. Now, as a quick note here too, AMD is also announcing several consumer processors. We've already reported on this. We're filming this actually before the official announcement. We know the announcement's coming at time of filming, but can't talk about it, uh, and so we don't have any details today, but me from yesterday and the other video knows about it. So there's a bunch of desktop series stuff coming as well for Ryzen, but this focus on Threadripper. So AMD is raising the boost clocks up to 4.5 gigahertz for these components. This is a noticeable jump over the Threadripper Pro 3000 CPUs from previously, and it's one that can be attributed to the new Zen 3 cores moving up in architectural generation. Now, additionally, all of the Threadripper Pro 5000 SKUs should benefit from AMD's overhauling of its L3 cache structure with Zen 3, whereby eight core CCDs have access to a unified 32 megabytes of L3 cache. Now, where Threadripper has historically separated itself is its heavy I.O. assortment, where you get a ton of PCIe lanes and a lot of memory capabilities and capacity without having to go into Epic CPUs. And that continues here, where Threadripper Pro 5000 will support eight memory channels uh, and up to two terabytes of memory. This is still DDR4, as a reminder, so this is not moving to DDR5. It's the Zen 3 architecture, so that's not new, and so obviously it's going to stay on the older memory as well. Uh, anyway, DDR4-3200 at two terabytes is the maximum official support. AMD is also rolling out a new hardware-level security stack, which is known as Shadow Stack, and AMD's Shadow Stack is largely aimed at mitigating control flow attacks and works with Microsoft's hardware-enforced stack protection. AMD's Threadripper Pro 5000 line will be anchored by the flagship 5995WX, that's a 64-core 128-thread part, with a base frequency of 2.7 GHz and a boost of 4.5. Four other SKUs also follow this one. There's the 5975WX, that's 32-core 64 threads, 5965WX at 24 cores and 48 threads, the 5955 at 16 cores and 32 threads, and the 5945WX at 12 cores and 24 threads. Of course, these lower end ones get a little bit weird because there's the 5950X and 5900X in the sort of consumer class or desktop class family of AMD CPUs where you get the same core count and uh, some better capabilities in things like overclocking, but there is a change, for example, to the I.O. So that's the key difference between these. AMD notes that the Threadripper, well, and the price, you get to pay a lot more. AMD notes that the Threadripper Pro 5000 SKUs will be OEM only, at least initially, and uh, Lenovo is going to be the first one to ship from what we understand. AMD has noted that Lenovo is launching its ThinkStation P620, and that'll be available starting March 21st. 
via Lenovo directly. That'll be uh, the first one containing Threadripper 5000 series chips. Should you require any additional evidence that non-monolithic dyes are the way forward for silicon products, we invite you to ponder the news of Intel, AMD, and ARM working together, or as Artesian Build CEO Noah Katz might say, collaborating. You've got to be collaborating. To found and support a new open standard for chiplet interconnect. Uh, this is the Universal Chiplet Interconnect Express, or UCIE. The overall idea is similar to what we've seen with PCIE, whereby those involved will help to create and maintain an open standard, but instead of an interconnect for expansion cards, it would be an interconnect for chiplets. The ultimate goal will be to create a ubiquitous interconnect replete with a multi-vendor chiplet ecosystem where chiplets are platform agnostic and interoperable. What that means in non-buzzword human language is that the chipsets might be able to be transplanted between boards irrespective of the CPU that is going on that board. Now, this doesn't change the fact that the socket type still will need to be compatible. So this probably won't be as, almost certainly, will not be as simple as you buy a motherboard and then you put any CPU in it. Guaranteed, that's not how it's going to go, at least not for a long time. Um, so what this really is focusing on is just you buy a motherboard and the chips that supply for that board can come from the same pool of supply that would be used on AMD, or Intel, or in this case, probably ARM as well, uh, which would, in theory, help reduce some of the cost just if economies of scale come into play here. Anyway, to date, the big players all have their own proprietary interconnect and die-to-die -die, uh, communication and buses. AMD, for example, at least, especially if you're talking about Threadripper or Epic, where the IO die is on the CPU, has Infinity Fabric. Intel has its Advanced Interface Bus, or AIB, and to Intel's credit, it has also made efforts to standardize these types of interconnects before, and it seems it will be donating AIB to the UCIE standard to get things started. This is still technically just talk, but there has been a little bit of movement. So for example, UCIE 1.0, the document, has already been ratified and is available now online. This will leverage PCIe and CXL. CXL, if you don't recall, is another open standard interconnect that we've discussed before that has had multiple competing companies collaborating. And as far as timelines, who knows? This kind of stuff is always really slow to move. Uh, hopefully this is an instance where it actually is like a standardization and not just let's introduce a new standard to go with the other standards. But since this is basically all of the competing companies, at least in this space, probably there's uh, some hope that it won't just muddy things. Up next, the controversial saga of AVX 512 support on Intel's Alder Lake has come to an end as Intel has elected to disable AVX 512 entirely for future Alder Lake CPUs. Intel initially announced that AVX 512 support would not be a feature for its Alder Lake CPUs due to the hybrid core topology consisting of two disparate architectures, one of which doesn't support AVX 512. However, when Alder Lake shipped, it was sort of accidentally present. The motherboard manufacturers had the capability to enable AVX 512 support. This was done through various means, but the most common of them was to disable the E cores and run only P cores, which were able to, to run AVX 512. Now, Intel said at the time that AVX 512 was not officially supported, warned against using it on Alder Lake CPUs, and basically said, probably we're going to kill this capability. While Intel did make good on its promise to kill AVX 512 through new microcode, MSI one-upped them by putting an option to switch between UEFI BIOS versions in some of its Z690 motherboard firmware and basically re-enable it. This is one of the more fun instances of motherboard manufacturers just going completely against their chipset and technology supplier. You see this a lot where MSI, Asus, Gigabyte, one point or another, they've uh, ASRock especially, Biostar especially, they've all sort of sidestepped the official intent of the CPU or uh, chipset manufacturer and have enabled things that technically they can enable and therefore they're going to. So it's a fun back and forth. Now, of course, Intel seeing this was unhappy and decided to go with a new policy of scorched earth and uh, fused off the feature in the silicon entirely. So going forward, the new CPUs will not be able to leverage even the BIOS switching feature in boards like MSIs that have it. And maybe there'll be some additional value in the Alder Lake CPUs that have shipped thus far as a result, but uh, who knows? It kind of depends if there's a market for that. Anyway, Intel at this point clearly wants to make sure that for AVX 512, you can't see it again on Alder Lake.
you can literally see it. Tom's hardware was tipped off by an anonymous source that newer Alder Lake non-K CPUs do have that fused off uh, AVX 512 feature. So Tom's reached out to Intel and received the following statement, quote, although AVX 512 was not fused disabled on certain early Alder Lake desktop products, Intel plans to fuse off AVX 512 on Alder Lake products going forward. So that'll be it then. There's no more getting AVX 512 out of newer Alder Lake CPUs. Although if you have one of the ones that's come out at least maybe until now and a board that supports switching or you're running on older microcode, older BIOS, then you'll be able to still use it if you really want to. And the next story is a little bit sad, but we did want to bring light to the contributions of David Boggs, who is the Ethernet pioneer uh, who recently died at the age of 71. And we wanted to share some of what he had worked on, what he was best known for to just make sure everyone can appreciate the work that was contributed by this very important engineer in the industry. David Boggs worked as an electrical engineer and was best known for his contributions alongside Robert Metcalf. These included the creation of the networking technology that we know today as Ethernet, though his contributions and work also extended to the development of other facets of computing, such as various internet protocols, switches, gateways, and network cards. We have Boggs largely to thanks for the fact that you're even able to watch this video right now. Eventually, Boggs met Robert Metcalf, who was working on debugging Aloha Net network models and ARPANET's interface message processor, or IMP, both of which were early networking models that proved to be the foundation for wireless networks and routers, respectively. Boggs and Metcalf would eventually work together to co-invent Ethernet, with Metcalf providing theories and ideas and Boggs building the necessary hardware. So the two worked together in the very classic example of engineering and building met with ideas and innovation. And as a team, they were able to produce these many technologies that uh, we've just talked about. From Robert Metcalf, there was this quote recently, quote, he was the perfect partner for me. I was more of a concept artist and he was a build the hardware in the back room engineer. Boggs' contributions can't really be understated because without the work he did and with Robert Metcalf, it's very unlikely we would have the internet that we have today. And uh, if this topic or other computer history topics interest you. There's plenty of articles and some Wikipedia information out there on the contributions that he provided. We definitely encourage you to go check it out and be a little more informed on where the industry came from today. Up next, Intel is bringing new in-field scan features to Sapphire Rapids. In a new Linux driver that surfaced recently, it was spotted that Intel is cooking up a new feature for its CPUs known as in-field scan. The code for in-field scan was spotted by the folks over at Pharonix who subsequently broke the news. According to Pharonix, as well as the documentation in the Linux mailing list detailing the driver, in-field scan, or IFS, is a new hardware feature to run circuit-level tests on a CPU core that would not otherwise be detected by other hardware tests, such as parity or ECC checks. Now, the cool thing with in-field scan is that it'll be deployed on, at least for now, server CPUs. So this would include Intel's upcoming Sapphire Rapids scalable Xeon processors, and it's used for detecting CPU failures or defects after the CPU has been deployed and is in service. And these are specifically in CPU failures. So there's not really a great mechanism right now other than just manual troubleshooting with some assistance from automation to figure out if a CPU has gone defective or is defective. You just have to figure it out yourself. From how we understand it, in-field scan would be useful to be an in-hardware detector for early failures or existing failures in the silicon that uh, escape. So these are product escapes like from the fab where they pass all the inspection there and perhaps later in life something in the silicon starts to go bad. Maybe there's a particularly bad ESD event or it's just getting worn or thermal damage or whatever. Anyway, this is potentially interesting because it would help maximize server uptime uh, especially as the expense of silicon ages. According to recent rumors and probably the hack where a lot of NVIDIA information was uh, obtained, NVIDIA's upcoming and yet to be announced ADA GPUs, formerly codenamed Lovelace, same person, will contain up to or over 18,000 CUDA cores. Now ADA has not officially been announced yet. It's supposed to be the successor to the Ampere GPUs. That would be the RTX 30 series and ADA would likely be RTX 40 series, assuming GeForce cards ship on that architecture. There's only been a couple recently where NVIDIA has skipped an architecture 
to ship GeForce cards under something else. But likely we'll see this both in scientific computing first and then you know, gaming later after that. A supposed AD-102, or likely an RTX 4090 or a Titan or something, could feature as many as 144 SMs, if this information is accurate, which would translate to over 18,000 CUDA cores across a single die, assuming the same sort of CUDA per SM assignment that we have today. For comparison, a fully enabled GA-102 die hosts 10,752 CUDA cores. Elsewhere, a supposed AD-103 die could offer up to 84 SMs, which would maybe be the current equivalent of a GA-102 3090 Ti, if that ever happens. Late January, remember? The RTX 3090 Ti. An AD-104 and AD-106 solution could offer in the range of 60 SMs and 36 SMs, respectively. Now, as for SM layout and CUDA cores, a couple important points here. You can't really like for like compare CUDA cores between architectures. There are efficiency upgrades uh, that make them just really incomparable, at least linearly. You would need to know more behind what has changed architecturally. Additionally, for the SM layout, we don't know what's changed there. So there might be differences, there likely are, to the tensor core presence, the RT presence, the percentage of the SM that is constituted by FP32 or floating point 32 uh, capabilities versus FP64 versus the RT and tensor capabilities. Additionally, there's been a rumor that NVIDIA's ADA GPUs could have L2 cache sizes 16 times what we're currently seeing with Ampere. The rumored AD102 die would have as much as 96 megabytes of L2 if this is the case, while the smaller silicon would offer L2 caches between 64 and 32 megabytes. This may be something of a response to AMD's Infinity Cache approach for its RX 6000 series, but uh, you start getting into architectural differences there where other factors matter more than just comparing cache to cache. You do have to factor in how the GPU actually works. It could also be that NVIDIA is sort of ramping up towards maybe an MCM approach in the future and uh, trying things out. Now, finally, MSI has gotten some ideas recently. It's probably just heard of the brand new Microsoft Xbox One console and has decided to make its own Trident S. That's okay. That's a little on the nose, MSI. Anyway, the the Trident Series S uh, 5M PC is apparently a PC aimed at cloud computing uh, and gaming. Anyway, it's supposed to make use of an AMD APU with a choice between AMD's R750 700G, R550 600G, or R350 300G, all of which leverage Radeon graphics in the Vega family, but vary depending on the SKU. MSI boasts that the Trident S is a 2.6 liter chassis, it therefore does not have room to add a DGPU. Uh, the Trident S5M also uses an unspecified B300 chipset-based motherboard, which apparently houses two M.2 2280 SSD, at least slots, if not SSDs themselves, and an additional two and a half inch SSD or laptop hard drive bay. The machine will come equipped with two DDR4 3200 megahertz SODIMM modules, with support for up to 64 gigabytes of system memory. We'll put the I.O. capabilities on the screen in case you care, but there's also Intel Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 4.2 support, rounding out the uh, connectivity options for things like controllers, and obviously internet. We haven't seen pricing for the MSI Series S Trident yet. We're looking forward to see if, uh, I'm actually not sure if there's a design patent on the look of the Series S, the one by Microsoft. Maybe it's not close enough or confusingly similar, but anyway, just MSI doing MSI things. We look forward to the MSI Trident S refrigerator in the future. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. You can go to store.gamersaccess.net or patreon.com slash gamersaccess to help us out directly, and we'll see you all next time.